Do I like some sort of banter before? There you, start, you are. Right? You you were gone for a moment. Now you are. Okay. Oh. Uh, so we're on. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Liberty.me Live. I'm going to get out of your hair. Here's uh, Jeffrey Tucker and Scott Horton. I think, well, uh, Scott, the face, uh, your, your face changed when we went live. You suddenly had a, a look of, of terror or something. Well, <laughs> no, what happened was I reopened iTunes and it changed the color. I got. Okay. I'm surrounded by screens here. Jeff is the problem. There's too many screens. Okay. Tell me when there's okay. more than enough light on my ugly face here. Well, okay, because it seemed it seemed like you had a look of like horror or something. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> like. Welcome everybody to the show. <laughs> yes, welcome everybody. Um, we're on. Yeah, we're on. Uh, if you'll just excuse me one quick second, I'll be right back, and 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 then we'll get this thing going. It's eight o'clock exactly, or nine o'clock, eight oh one. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. I'm Scott. Nice to see you. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take some audience questions um, as we go on here. I think we should. Yeah, uh, you know we should have gone over with Mike again how to see the chat. I know they they can put questions at the bottom, but there's a chat room too. Oh, maybe. So I, I left prematurely. Questions. Okay, okay. Oh, there you go. Uh, so hey, yeah, there's there's the regular yeah, yeah, chat on the right, but and you can just talk to people informally there. But the formal like real questions are just below. So if you scroll down a tiny bit, you're gonna see a question from Jesse Lowe's, and he's got a question that begins, "My chief concern." Yes. Yeah, and we can oh, we see, can promote yeah, yeah. that question up. Exactly. Top. If you go hover over the up arrow, it says "Put on air." You put that on air, and then you then everybody knows that's the question you're talking about because it shows up on their screens. They can actually see it just like that. There you go. Now Jesse's famous. I was about to say, I, I, I thought I deleted the question. Okay, no, but it's there. Yeah, it is. it's up there. Yeah, and then when you're done with it, you, you, you delete the second. question with the eggs. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, no, we'll get right to that. Too. that okay, so I'm going to retreat one, yeah, I mean, one more time, but I'll be right right here if you guys need me for anything. So Thank we might as well much, answer Mike. this question like immediately. Yeah, I'm going to read it. My chief in regards to fighting the empire is decades of clandestine operations within, which have infiltrated most, if not all, the major players in today's global political arena. Is there any way we can uh, we can fully discover and disclose these operations, their operators, their financiers, and map out the effects of the causes? Furthermore, how can we do this without kicking the beehive and creating more anti-U.S. aggression? I'm not sure I understand the last implication that somehow. Um, well, anyway, I don't. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think technology is the answer. Basically, little brother watching back, eye on the empire, so to speak. And, uh, you know, this is why Barrett Brown, the great journalist Barrett Brown, is in federal prison right now, is because they're persecuting him under the color of prosecuting him because he had this project called Project PM, which was basically taking, you know, the, the very brightest hacker sources and setting them to work on deciphering exactly what he's talking about, which all, especially these private intelligence companies that have grown up since September 11th and the new Homeland Security, National Security State, doubled and tripled as it's been since 9-11, uh, and, and mapping out who all is doing what. And there was, you might remember the hack where there was the company H.B. Gary was going to go after Glenn Greenwald and other journalists for daring to stick up for WikiLeaks and stuff like that. And uh, so that was kind of what started that and got the ball rolling. And I think ultimately, like, that's what we need, right, is a, a website where we can go to where you can really see who all is interlocking with which agencies and which boards of directors in which ways. I mean, there's got to be writing to go along with it to provide the context, but I think that uh, probably – a lot of that information is there and really just waiting for uh, Aaron Schwartz type to figure out the right script to write to, you know, make it make sense on our GUI. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, I mean, the information is out there. I mean, antiwar.com publishes every day. I mean, I, you know, the Snowden revelations. There's, you know, I feel this way a lot about domestic policy. People say, well, how come there's not good sources to find out? What the government's doing to people? Well, there are the sources. The problem is not an, an absence of information. It's it's a, a lack of attention, and 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 a, a people's sort of willful blindness to not face the truth. I mean, I, I think that 
you know, after the Snowden revelations and everything, that there, there ought to be, I mean, there should, should be a revolution, you know, essentially. But it doesn't happen because people are just willfully blind, especially Americans are weirdly um, in love with their own uh, nation to the extent that there's, there's almost a, a kind of a, a perception of America as a, as a, as a, on a holy cause, you know, all the time. That's been true throughout American history. It's not somehow just now. I mean, that was true in the 19th century. It's true in the 18th century. I mean, it's, it's, it seems to be part of our national culture. And I think it's, it's actually worse in the U.S. than it is in most other countries, actually. Uh, people don't like their domestic government and so much of what it does, but, but on an international scale, people are, are, are willfully blind as to what the U.S. is doing. Um, uh, I mean, you never hear Frank talk about the American empire uh, in a, American presidential debates, uh, for example. I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's just not part of American popular culture. I mean, I, you know, Scott and I have t talked a lot about 9-11, but, you know, my, my first response after 9-11 was, wow, now finally people will see the costs that are associated with American imperialism and, and finally draw the line and say, you know, we've had enough of this. Uh, we're not going to face these kinds of costs as, you know, that, that will inevitably come with, with a global imperial uh, state. But it turned out, of course, that that's not what happened. I mean, most, most Americans just assume we're a peaceful commercial empire, uh, minding our own business, you know, eating hot dogs and watching baseball and, 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 and weird, you know, foreign peoples for irrational reasons, you know, are coming after us uh, uh, based on, for no reason whatsoever. That's the predominant uh, American cultural assumption behind American foreign policy, as I understand it. Well, you know, a couple of things there. First of all, on the exceptionalism, you know, I guess I just can't help it because I'm from here that I'm raised on this exceptionalism too. I always think of America as a very special place just because if there's one thing that the society supposedly agrees on, it's liberty and justice for all. That what a what a great way to form not just a you know, a government and whatever with that as their slogan, but what a great thing for a society to agree that that's their highest principle is that we we got to have liberty we got to make sure that freedom is first and so but then the problem is people go yeah we're so special that all of a sudden taking freedom away from you isn't wrong and we're so uh you know exceptional that sins no longer apply to our behaviors anything we do is good because of the motive of it and you end up uh well like you said blind to the causes of, of what's going on and then also you know more willing to cause worse disasters, and you know when you mention the the uh, you know the what should have been the reaction to September 11th and how people didn't really get it. It was you know and the imagery is perfect, right? You all saw those planes that came out of the clear blue sky, and so it's just perfectly ripe for you know false interpretations. So Bush said they hate us because we're good. And people remembered the Clinton years as peacetime, so they couldn't figure out, you know, any other, um, you know, explanation than that off the top of their head. And the only other explanation, Jeffrey, and this is the same, and I remember driving down the road in September of 01, and some guy was on right-wing radio, a guest was on right-wing radio, and he's saying, they just won't admit the real problem. George Bush says they hate us because we're free, but that's not really it what it really is, and I'm going, say it, say it. Bill Clinton in, intervened over there for eight years straight, right? Say that. And he says, the real answer is, Islam is evil. Islam is the religion of Satan. Islam mandates that people who believe in it strike out and kill things that are good and true and beautiful and innocent. And so, you know, it was just the perfect kind of awaken a sleeping giant fake metaphor uh, you know, left over from Pearl Harbor, that now we have been attacked by pure evil based on its most core beliefs, its most yeah. core faith of the society that we're against. There's a billion of them. We can fight them forever. And as long as they resist us, we'll call their resistance aggression. And it was perfect for the state, but it was perfect for the people too. Because in America... <laughs> There's no difference between a hero and a victim. You know what I mean? That's that's all we got to do to be great is to be the victim of somebody bad once did something to us. And so that's kind of a culture-wide thing. And so now 
Sorry to go on. But Anthony Gregory pointed out that George Bush used to say, we're not at war with Islam. This is a very small radical sect of weirdos who pervert this, you know, wonderful faith and has nothing to do with that. But as soon as Bush was gone, it was like taking the lid off the pot and it all just boiled over. And then especially it wasn't even electing Hillary, a liberal Democrat. It was electing Barack Obama, a black man with a Muslim sounding name. And so all the birther stuff about him being secretly born in Kenya and secretly yes. being a Muslim and on the on the more like talk radio populist right, this amounted to like he was a usurper. He was some terrorist usurper who came and took over our rightful government. Everything's going just fine. And that was just multiplied the Islamophobia nonsense ridiculously. And then, of course, there are people who have a very vested interest in spreading it, like Frank Gaffney and other warmongers who spread this Islamophobia nonsense. On they're purpose. desperate, but they're the desperate for an enemy. That, like you're saying, and uh, if we won't even try to understand how we got into this mess, how are we ever going to come to the proper decision on how to get out of it? You, you know, this, I, 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 it was impossible for me to believe this turn of events. I mean, like I never believed the propaganda because uh, one reason is that I, you know, I, we all remember the time when we first became conscious of, of politics, right? Well, the time when I became conscious of politics was, was at the very time when the Reagan administration was funding uh, uh, so-called freedom fighters around the world, right? And, there, and especially in Afghanistan, there were uh, uh, radical uh, Islam, you know, was the was a strong resistance force to, to Soviet uh, imperialism. So the right wing in those days, and I'm talking about like 1985, 86, 87, that sort of period, was uh, propagandizing its own people about the glories of Islam, that really um, the American right wing and... Um, the Islamic resistance to uh, Soviet socialism, uh, we have so much in common. We're, we're in favor of traditional values. Uh, we, we, we're, we're people of the book. Um, we believe in, in the family as a core unit of society and so on, right? This, this was the right-wing line that you got all throughout those, that, 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 that period. It was all to kind of warm people up um, to a kind of a Cold War uh, anti-Soviet ideology. And in fact, uh, uh, American conservatives in Washington, D.C. were bringing over members of the Mujahideen uh, back in those days to court them for, you know, and put them on parade at their dinner parties and, and, and special right-wing luncheons. You know? This was going on um, all the time. So it was just a little bit strange, at least for me, I mean, I, I didn't believe that. I thought that was a little bit implausible to begin with. You know, I mean, it's, just, it's just hard to imagine that um, Mujahideen would have signed up entirely for the Republican Party uh, uh, platform, right? But um, uh, but then, of course, it, just like in Orwell, the line changed universally overnight, and suddenly to be a truly right wing was not not just to have an exaggerated love for Islam, but was to have a hysterical hate for it. You know. And this this is true that the that we're talking about a ten year separation between the two lines, but it's very much like Orwell, really, in some ways. It's like we must we're you're required to love Islam and then it's like you know you're required to hate Islam. You know, it just it just this the same people, the same organizations, the same interest groups, the same political parties just reverse the line, you know, practically overnight, you know, purely based on geopolitical priorities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and so here's the other thing about this is there's a renewed push. And, you know, <laughs> I uh, it, it's been quite a few years, but I'm now back in the habit of watching nothing but Fox News all day. Just I want it as bad as I can get it, basically. And it's pretty clear, you know, it's just it's kind of read between the lines stuff. It's not ironclad, but it, it seems pretty obvious to me that there's a brand new branding going on, a brand new marketing uh, public relations push uh to you know uh and it's not that it's new it's just that they've kind of brought it up doubled and tripled the the effort to uh to say that the enemy is radical islam radical islam and then they attack they have that as their their kind of fake premise and then they say why won't obama admit that the enemy is radical islam radical islam 
And of course, by doing that, what they're doing is they're papering over any differences between any of the adversaries that they've created for themselves over there in the first place, pretending that, you know, Hamas is the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, is Al-Qaeda, is Hezbollah, is ISIS and Badr too, and whatever, whoever they want to fight. But what it's really about is Iran. It's really about saying, oh, so you're upset about Baghdadi and the Islamic State and all the beheadings, huh? Well, let us tell you, there's no difference at all between the Caliph, Ibrahim, now in Iraq and Syria, and the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. And the agenda is so obvious. It's to try to undermine the nuclear deal that Obama is trying to make with Iran right now, where we will lift the sanctions and stop threatening to bomb them all the time over their safeguarded civilian nuclear program that will then be under expanded inspections and restrictions. And, um, and they're just lying. It's the most cynical thing. And, you know, as much as I'm frustrated with the left and the right equally, I think, it's always amazing to me how it seems like a doctrine among leaders of the right that everything we say, even unnecessarily, has to be a lie. Everything. Because we don't, we want you know to only focus on the people who will believe us no matter what, and you know forget everybody else. And so they just won't say anything that's true. And so uh, you have a lie as blatant as uh, you know Iran and the Islamic State that are of course deadly enemies are all the same thing, even though really America's been fighting for Iran in Iraq since 2003 and we still are there are allies against the islamic state not that i'm saying that they should be but i'm just saying that's some axis of evil when the ayatollah always hated saddam and he hates the uh islamic state even more than he ever hated saddam but they just want to confuse us and pretend that all their mostly israel's enemies are our enemies and and they're in in order of their priorities iran first isis last so did I understand you right to say that, in your view, the right wing has a more uh, sort of vituperative uh, uh, ideological homogeneity on matters of foreign policy than you detect on the left? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that there are enough different kinds of leftists who don't care for the Democrats, really, who have more or less stayed good, not as a big anti-war movement and all that. Um, but, you know, the right wing outside of the American Conservative magazine and a few other places like that, I think the right wing is pretty much down for whatever the GOP tells them to. Yeah, in the end. On a daily basis, it can change. Yeah, in the end, that's true. Um, I hadn't been to National Review in a while. I don't know if you follow National Review, but um, they got a new web design, so I decided to look at it again and just check it out. And, you know, I like a lot of the things that appear in National Review. There's some very good people that write for it. You know, I like a lot of the economic commentary. You know, there's a lot of very good stuff. But um, what's, what's strange is that at least on the day that I looked at it, this is a few days ago, the anti-Islamic uh, mania was, like, completely out of control. You know, that was clearly the dominant theme of the site. It seemed to be the, the driving issue and the, and the, the, the driving ethos of the entire uh, website, from what I could tell. And it's, it's very interesting to me, because this, this has been true for the American right since, certainly since about, um, since, you know, uh, the mid-1950s, maybe late, late 1950s. You know, despite however good uh, the right wing is on some matters, um, particularly with regard to, you know, economics and some social policies and, and that sort of thing. In the end, the, the core of, of American right-wing ideology has, has been about American imperialism. imperialism. That's, that's the one thing that uh, really riles up the masses, that unites the commentators, that, you know, uh, rallies the funders, you know, in the end, it's it's about American imperialism. Despite brief moments, you know, I remember in the 1990s, uh, the American right wing became sort of briefly skeptical of American Im imperialism insofar it was run by by Democrats. You know, um, but that was you know it was a very, fairly brief moment. In the end, American right wing theory just defaults back to a, a kind of um, a belligerent uh, uh, imperialist. Uh, you know, garrison state uh, ideology. I mean, that's that's really what it's all about. Despite 
however good it might be on this or that other subject. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Um, you know, and what's funny about it, of course, is that, you know, uh, for example, there's this uh, documentary called World War Four that was made by a guy who had helped campaign for Bush and then got very disillusioned with him. And in that documentary, he interviews Michael Ledeen, the uh, arch neoconservative from the National Review, who over and over again wrote, faster, please, faster, please, more wars all the time. We must turn the entire Middle East into a boiling cauldron, he would say. And this guy, uh, I forget his name now, I'm sorry, but the guy that made World War IV, he asked Michael Ledeen, but I don't get it. What's so conservative about world revolution? And Ledeen said, I don't know. That's just what they call us, but I agree with you completely. I'm not a conservative whatsoever. I want to you know, turn the world absolutely upside down. And more or less, he doesn't care who dies during it either. Uh, you know, so what in fact is conservative about a world empire that just on paper we couldn't possibly afford even if they did greet us with candy and right. flowers instead of resentment and IEDs? It's ridiculous. You know, Murray Rothbard used to tell the story of this is what drove him out of, out of the right and made him, uh, you know, seek out alliances just anywhere else, you know, but the right. Um, that he he would tell stories of being at at events like large scale conservative right wing gatherings in the 1960s, and he would stand up and give a speech calling for tax cuts and deregulation, and um, you know the end of the public schooling monopoly, the the end of uh, uh, you know whatever kind of bureaucratic management of economic life or whatever, and people would politely collapse, you know, and and sort of appreciate what he said, and it's great. He would sit down, and the next speaker would stand up and give, you know, just a frothing at the mouth anti-communist speech calling for global war, a massive nuclear buildup, and invading, invading the world essentially. And he said it was just disgusting that that this is the 1960s that that people would get up on their chairs, you know, and and cheering and just like, you know, just like this bloodlust, you know, the whole place would ex explode in in hysteria. You know, uh, this was the thing that riled people up, and and no amount of domestic anti-statism uh, could really do it. Like like people very politely appreciating the spirit in which Murray spoke, <laughs> but in the end, it's uh, it's 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 the the lust for war that really got people up on their chairs going crazy. And yeah, I'm sorry to say it's still true. Yep. I would have thought that by the end of the Cold War, all this stuff would have gone away, but of course it's worse than ever. And yeah, no, because then we had competition. Now we're number one, Jeff. You can't beat that, being number one. Yeah, mean, meanwhile, American you know, domestic oppression of, of the citizenry is, is proceeding at a pace, and um, uh, people are suffering all over the place, which I, I write about most of the time, right? I mean, this is... Not so much that people are suffering, but that that people are figuring out ways around the system, which I think is you know so absolutely the most the most critically important thing you can do to ever bring about liberty in your life is to uh, to to get away from the central plan in every every conceivable uh, way. Um, you know, foreign policy distracts people from the oppression and tyranny they're experiencing at home, and. And sometimes it seems like that's sort of the whole purpose of it, you know? It's like, don't don't pay attention to the domestic tyrants that are robbing you, you know, all the time and ruining your life and stealing your kids' lives, putting them into crappy schools, ruining their job prospects through regulations, destroying the labor markets, inflating the money supply, uh, uh, ruining the prospects for, for social and economic advance. Don't pay any attention to that. Look, look at these bad guys, you know, overseas, uh, ones uh, that are, that are the real problem. Yeah, absolutely. Real... And it makes it makes every other policy pale in comparison. These guys are trying to kill us, and you want to argue about the budget? You want to argue about the deficit? You want to argue about, you know, oh boo hoo, they're tapping your phone? Wouldn't you rather have your phone tap than your body exploded? <laughs> and you know, they can just go on like that forever. You know, and apparently people keep buying it, although we do have some victories like Syria in 2013. People just weren't buying that. And it's true that I think, you know, a lot of the really the national security state wasn't buying that either. 
And, you know, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff didn't really want to do it. So that helped. But the American people, um, it was, you know, uh, 90-something percent in the polls against that war. And Obama had to back down. Yeah, that's rather amazing. He, he basically passed the buck to Congress, and then they didn't even hold a vote. Mm -hmm. So it goes to show that, you know, I don't know what it goes to show. We did have a lot, a lot of people on the inside of the state who agreed with us on that one, I think, is what really did it. But, it, well, it did go to show that Americans really can be mobilized against a war if the flavor is right, I guess, if you, you know, unless you have the right beheading video or something. I, we, had a, we had two questions, and I put two up at once, and I think it caused one to delete itself. Um, so that was my, mis my oh. mistake. Um, uh, another question says, I think the first one was something about Lebanon. Go ahead. Then maybe, yeah, uh, if you saw something about Lebanon. About, oh, no, it's still there at the bottom is that one. That's not it. Oh, huh? okay. I don't see it at the bottom. Oh, well, that's fine. Can you read it? I see one at the top and one at the bottom. I don't know. If, if somebody did get deleted, please repost and we'll get to it in just a sec. Hey, let me say real quick before we go to this, uh, before we go to this next question, Jeff, that uh, I wanted to explain why we named the show Eye on the Empire, and that's in honor of uh, both of our dear old friend Alan Bach, the late, great Alan Bach, who died back in, what, 2012? Yeah, right, it was something like that. He was a good friend of mine, and uh, I miss him. He used to write for the Orange County Register, um, which was a, a big deal. You know, back, and I think he did this before, you know, all newspapers were online. The Orange County was a hugely important institution, I would say, in American life because it became a kind of a home for, you know, dissident libertarians. You know, the, uh, there were a lot of people that were writing for it at the time, and Alan Bach was primary among them, who was just heroic. I mean, they used to run me all the time when he was uh, a, a writer there, and that's not why they were heroic. It was just, you know, he was an independent voice, and um, yeah, he was he was a great man and a, and a sweet man. But yeah, he died. Very young, actually, uh, a few years ago. Well, the other thing is... Yeah, uh, in the chat room, they say 2011 there. Yeah. Yeah, um, Yeah, Alan was great. And, you know, when I first started reading Antiwar.com, well, I had read it some in 99, but when I first really started reading again was in 2002 in the run-up to the Iraq War. And uh, I would read Alan Bach all the time. And then when I started the interview show in 2003, he was my first guest. Wasn't that amazing? That I had You've been doing your interview show for 10 years? For 12 years? I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. Um, and you know, it's funny, too. If you go back and listen, the audio quality is pretty bad. But if you listen, Alan and I both, but especially him, just get absolutely everything right about the Iraq War and how they lied us into it and what all bad is going to happen after that and everything. And it was recorded, I think, two days after they pulled down Saddam's statue in the fall of Baghdad and the big fake PR stunt there. And anyway, if you go back and listen to that, it's pretty astounding how brilliant Alan Bach is and the answers that he gave to my, you know, pretty amateurish take on, you know, what I was asking him. And uh, But anyway, he was great. When I lived in L.A., I got to hang out with him a few times. He lived out in the Inland Empire, but... I got to hang out with him a few times when I lived out there in person, so that was really cool. Interview him in, in person in the studio and all that. So um, I just thought that'd be a great name for the show and, and maybe help, you know, even to advertise if people want to go back and see how easy it could have been for everyone to be right on the Iraq War back in 2002 and three. Go and look at his column. You can find the link right there at antiwar.com in the right margin. You'll see his name, Alan Bach, and go back and take a look through those archives. There's some brilliant. Very, very libertarian stuff, Jeff. Well, once you get a sense of the dynamic of American intervention, whether it's at home or abroad, then you get a sense of it. This is what's so weird to me about, uh, it's always been the strange thing about post-war American right-wing ideology is they, they understand the failures of government at, at, at home in many, many areas. But these vac exact same people can, ima can imagine the government to be powerful and omnipotent and, and blessing the world with, with freedom and prosperity uh, uh, abroad, you know, it's, it's a radical inconsistency in these ideologies. Yeah, definitely. So that's the point of um, eye on the empire. It's not just a, a foreign empire; it's a domestic empire too, invading our lives every day in every way. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, as you're kind of saying there, 
the the ways that the foreign empire invades our domestic lives are the very worst things of all starting with the bankruptcy and then straight on to the militarization of the police and you know well you people know, don't understand the connection the, between you know the spawn. yeah this is it's really true um uh it's very interesting but people will talk about the advent of the of the american police state uh, at home and sort of really bad inflationary economic policy. I mean, sort of overall bad economic policy in the U.S., but they will disconnect it actually from, from foreign affairs. But actually there's a very, I think you and I have talked about this before, there's a really close link between um, the U.S. response to, to 9-11 and, what, and the housing bubble, actually, that ended up you know, sort of making such a mess of the financial system in, in, in 2008. It's not really possible to, to correctly think about one without considering the other. I mean, these, these things really play into each other. But we're so used to separating these things. It's like, on one hand, you have foreign policy specialists. On the other hand, you have economists, right? And they're, they're not supposed to touch each other or think even about the same subjects. But they're really very much tied together. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's a great metaphor there. And I really like the next question I want to get to in a second. But there's a great metaphor as well as a literal kind of thing about the boom and the bus cycle and the war there. Because on one hand, I think as you're saying, you can't have a terror war without inflation. You got to, uh, especially you want to have a bunch of bonus wars, go on to Iraq and wherever you want. You got to have bank credit expansion to coincide with that. Because if you raise everybody's taxes, they're going to be upset. But if you promise the war is going to be free, all right. And remember George Bush, he actually sent everybody a $300 rebate check in the mail. Like that was their dividend from the profit of invading Iraq. That's right even though, of course, Alan Greenspan just printed it, right? But that's to fool you and make you think it's free or maybe even profitable. But then the crash comes, uh, you know, five years later, and everybody's standing on the unemployment line, and they don't realize that that time is their price for killing all those Iraqis. Uh, you know, the artificially high price of their house that made them feel rich for a little while, and then the disaster that came when they found themselves unemployed and underwater, that's what they get for believing in the Republicans. I don't mean in a, oh, it's fair, but I just mean those are the consequences. But then at the same time, everywhere they go, it's not like we're fighting to defend ourselves from some foreign invader, right? We're fighting to remake the Middle East our way. And so what ends up happening is we're picking and choosing winners, just like, uh, you know, uh, Greenspan, Bernanke, and Yellen are picking win winners and losers on the market. Um, the American military and CIA are over there picking winners in politics and other people's That's a great countries. analogy. And, of course, they're always getting it wrong. They have that terrible information problem, and so they end up propping up people. Like, look at the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. They were on the eve of total defeat when we invaded in 2001. Even their leader was Osama bin Laden killed him with a suicide attack the day before 9-11 on September 10th. And their leader, Massoud, the former KGB agent. And... Um, so the Northern Alliance was basically nothing. Then America came and propped them up into this giant thing, stayed for a dozen and, and more years to put them in power and keep them there. And now what? Well, just like the bubbles got a pop on the stock market, it's the same thing with the power of the sock puppets in Afghanistan. So now America is finally more or less mostly leaving, and the Taliban are coming right back to power. And so instead of the surge working and the Taliban dealing on our terms back in 2011, like in Petraeus's promise, now America's dealing with the Taliban on their terms in 2015, because all they had to do was sit around and wait for the bubble to pop, for the artificially high value of the Northern Alliance's power to be dissipated into the market. And it's the same thing going on in Iraq right now as well. And, and it all is made possible by Greenspan and Bernanke. It is a you know, one-to-one -one equation there. Simple as that. In fact, you look at Iraq, they're literally shipping pallets of cash from the Federal Reserve, uh, the Mint, and, and the Federal Reserve in New Jersey and shipping it straight to Iraq, where they lost tens of, lost tens of billions of dollars worth of cash straight from the Fed to the pockets of the warlords. So you just, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a perfect literal and metaphorical thing at the same no, time. No, that's really a brilliant analysis. But it, you know, it really makes you realize something very important. Like probably the American warfare state, it might still be belligerent. You know, there might still be problems. There's always the, the problem of American cultural nationalism and all those sort of things. But without the central bank, you know, what could it have amounted to? 
you know, we should never forget that one of the first great public policy programs to follow the creation of the Federal Reserve was World War One. And Benjamin Anderson at the time did a did a study about the relationship between the so-called Great War at the time and and the central banks around the world, and he concluded that this war war could have never been waged, never would have been fought, never would have been attempted. Nobody would have followed, you know, even even believed there was any chance for it to take place, and wouldn't have pursued it were it not for central central banking around the world. And and this is true all over Europe. It was even less. It was it was true in the U.S. too. I mean, the U.S. didn't inflate as much as most European governments did. But if it weren't for central banks, uh, these 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 total wars and these unending imperial conquests uh, would would it be uh, completely infeasible. People would never put up with the taxes that it would cost to pay for this. It's not a coincidence that the first total war in history came about after uh, all the developed economies in the world got central banks. And a very, very short period after the U.S. created the Federal Reserve. Which makes you think, really, that in the end, the ultimate reform policy, the right uh, way to fix the system is to go after the central bank. In the end, you have to unplug the money machine or we're never going to fix it. Yeah. Well, and you know what? As long as we're at it, and you and me, uh, we may have discussed this on the radio before, Jeff, but uh, you could take that all the way to, you know, you, well, you go all different directions with that same analysis. Uh, I'm always reminded uh, when I had this discussion of George Carlin's bit about how he just, it's like his most America hating bit of all, because it's not about the government or the politicians, it's about all of us and how we have turned this beautiful, flawless, pristine continent into just nothing but a pile of strip malls. And it's nothing but Old Navy and Bed Bath and Beyond in big beige concrete boxes from sea to shining sea. No town is different than any other town anymore, anywhere in America. And it all sucks. It's all ugly. And it's major malls and mini malls and strip malls connecting the major malls and the mini malls and make me puke, right? And I can't help but agree with that. And uh, I also don't have to worry about any cognitive dissonance about uh, the free market coming up with all these outcomes that I don't approve of because, of course, there's nothing free about it at all. And the commercial real estate market, as much or more than any other over the past generation or two, has been absolutely distorted, completely out of control by all the artificially low interest rates and, uh, and uh, you know, stock market or uh, uh, property uh, value bubbles. And, you know, uh, Thomas Friedman at the New York Times, who gets all this wrong, that's where he, that's why he's so smart that everyone take or why he's so rich that everyone pretends he's smart is because he's married to a lady who made all her money on all these malls across America. So he can write whole books about how you shouldn't be able to expand your business because the environment. But meanwhile, his entire fortune comes from paving America over and all with money that he got from the Fed, that the Fed got with their magic wand, or pardon me, that he got, I skipped their step, that he got from Citigroup or Chase that they got by waving their magic wand, uh, their license uh, that they're granted by the government to expand bank credit and loan money to people that is not actual savings, but they just kind of made it up. So we don't really know what America would look like with a free market. We do know what it looks like when the Fed is subsidizing Thomas Friedman's wife's business for a generation and every other one like it all across America. We end up, as Carlin rightly says, with just these ugly scars everywhere uh, that that all things being equal, pe people may not have chosen to do things that way at all. Okay, so I, I, I think you're cut, you cut out in and out just there very briefly. Can you hear me okay, uh, Scott? Oh, no. Can yeah, you I hear can this? Hear you. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, I can. Uh, it seemed like we were having a little bit of a bandwidth problem on your end there, but it might have been my end, but uh, I have always heard you fine okay. all the time. Um, uh, chat room guys, too? Yeah. I th yeah. Oh, they lost me? You lost me? Okay. Yeah. So, Sorry. Well, anyway, this, I was this just is your, this, this is, is your problem, Scott. It's not every mine. Aspect of this problem. is all your fault. Uh, <laughs> but this, this is why... No, I was... This is why I was so excited in 2008 and why I continue to be wildly excited about the prospect of a private alternative 
to to the federal to the federal reserve and to the dollar economy uh, namely through crypt cryptography mm -hmm. and through distributed networks and and bitcoin in particular but it could be any cryptocurrency it doesn't really matter what matters is the technology is now available to to bypass at least come up with some private alternative to nationalized money nationalized money and uh in, internationalized war are just like you know hooked together they're part of the same package so uh to the extent that we can we can you know sort of move the markets towards embracing a, a privatized currency that's that's like a, a gold standard of the digital age you know, we do something about the very core of the problem without having to rely on reforms from the top down. That's that's the critical thing because reforms from the top down will never happen. They're not going to happen. But if there's a dollar crisis and and people can flee to another currency, have another alternative, another safe haven besides the nationalized money, then there's actually a way out of the system. And I I believe that this will eventually happen. I don't know when. Um, but I don't believe that um, government managed currencies can possibly survive in a fair competition or any competition with cryptocurrency over the long term. Yeah, well, I sure hope that's right. Um, I would like to see the entire government out of business. So yeah, right. You never get an argument from it. Uh, you want to get to this question here about um, what we should have done, what the U.S. government should have done after September 11th. I think uh, the answer to that is actually pretty simple, but mostly unknown, and that is that they very well could have negotiated the uh, arrest and handing over of Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri and their few dozen closest friends after September 11th. There were major factions of the Taliban who uh, considered Osama bin Laden to be nothing but a liability long before he got him into that mess. and. Um, uh, first of all, Anand Gopal, the great journalist from the Christian Science Monitor and the Wall Street Journal, uh, he's written a book called No Good Men Among the Living. Um, but actually, I guess this is, I don't know if this is in that book, it probably is, but it's in his reporting for the Wall Street Journal that um, uh, the Taliban was ready, absolutely ready to uh, negotiate and turn bin Laden over. And they actually started out saying, well, maybe we'll give him to a Muslim country. And then they said, well, we'll give them to a Muslim country. And then they said, I'll tell you what, we'll give them to the United Nations, which that's the Taliban saying, no, I'll tell you what, we'll turn them over to the United Nations. And then eventually they dropped all demands and said, look, just don't bomb us and uh, invade and we'll let you have them. And they had dropped at least virtually all conditions on his handing over. And there's a brand new book by a CIA guy who says virtually the same thing. Uh, I read an article about it where he says he was working on Mullah Omar and almost had him uh, ready to, to turn bin Laden over. And then, um, I'm not sure if you saw, but Arnaud Debor Grave died, the uh, longtime editor of the Washington Times and kind of an old anti-war paleocon type. I've interviewed him a few times. And then it turned out, lo and behold, and I probably should have guessed, that he was a mentor and a very good friend to Eric Margulies. And Eric Margulies wrote a great uh, obituary for him just the other day uh, that's really good. And one of the things that it says in there, and I didn't realize this, was that Arnaud Debor Grav was over there in Pakistan and Afghanistan negotiating with Mullah Omar. I don't know face to face, but at least was talking to Mullah Omar and was convincing Omar to give up bin Laden. And then the bombs started falling, the war was on, and the Bush administration never gave him a chance to achieve a diplomatic solution. That's amazing. And uh, that's mostly because they wanted to invade and regime change the Taliban and take over and occupy Afghanistan for, you know, hegemony reasons and they say energy reasons, but I think it's not so much about building a pipeline as preventing others from building pipelines through there uh, for a time. But, and they just, they wanted a demonstration for the American people that we're going to go kill some people. And back to what you were saying about the bloodlust, the American people, eh, you know, they might not have been satisfied with a negotiated surrender this and is trial a problem. for bin Laden. <laughs> you know, they might, you better drop a nuke or drop a daisy cutter on uh, somebody or we're just going to be unhappy around here, basically. Yeah, that was so, the environment at the time. Yeah, that was a big part of it. But they really didn't have to. I mean, they, they really didn't. And if you remember back then, Man, they were lying from the beginning, Jeff, when they said we're declaring war on terror, not Al-Qaeda. 
And when they said Al Qaeda Taliban, Al Qaeda Taliban, Al Qaeda Taliban, and tried to make everybody think that they were both the same thing, when the Taliban, of course, had nothing but parochial concerns and no interest in attacking the United States whatsoever. And then the irony, of course, is that, uh, and this is Anand Gopal again, uh, there's a letter from bin Laden to Mullah Omar from 2001 saying, I'm really sorry. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. But just you wait, man. Give me 10 years and you'll see. We're going to bankrupt them and run them on out of here and, and screw them up real bad. This is the best way to hurt them because that's what they're trying to do was lure us in to Afghanistan. As uh, Michael Scheuer, the former CIA officer, puts it, Iraq was the hoped for but unexpected gift. That was just the bonus. The plan was to get us to invade Afghanistan, which is unconquerable by outsiders, as has been proven time and time again, to replicate the Soviets' folly of the 1980s that you were referring to before, back when they were our heroes and freedom fighters on, you know, fighting on the side of light and justice against atheist communism. And uh, so that was the thing. In fact, I'll say one more thing about this just because I love it and it's hilarious. If you read the Rolling Stone from, I guess, uh, July or August 2010, there's an interview with bin Laden's son, and not his terrorist son, but his other son, who actually was jaded and left Afghanistan in the summer of 2001 uh, before the attack happened. And uh, he says that uh, Osama was so excited when Bush won the recount for Florida and was you know, declared by the Supreme Court to be the president because you know, Al Gore probably too. But bin Laden's assessment was that Bush would be so easy to provoke that here is the softest handed, handedest, pretendedest tough guy cheerleader in the world who, if I give him an opportunity, uh, give him a crisis to take advantage of, there is no question that he's going to do his worst. Absolutely. So here he is. He's the matador with the red cape. George Bush is the big dumb bull. And of course, Bush and Cheney and the neocons, they are all, I'm not, you know, acquitting them. They're evil and they were deliberately and, and cynically exploiting September 11th to overdo it and do whatever they wanted. But that's what Osama was counting on. That was the plan, was to give the American empire reason to overreact and destroy itself, which, as the show is documenting tonight and into the future, is uh, exactly what's going on and has been. Let me ask you a, a, a question if, to shift uh, over to the whole Russia Ukraine thing. I'm just because I I have friends that that have uh, that that are on both sides of this issue. I'm not sure I would even describe it as sides, but who have different takes. And I know that I only know from today that you've had very Twitter wars going on about this thing. So um, let me ask you this: Do you think it's possible to um, be both sympathetic to the Ukrainian separatist dissident independence movement and also oppose U.S. Uh, military intervention in this in this conflict. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think you mean support those who have overthrown the government in Ukraine and are celebrating the overthrow of the government and are against the separatists in the east. Because it's uh, the the Twitter wars you're referring to, the libertarians you're referring to, they're on the side of the empire, and it's uh, the Russians who are backing the separatists in the east, and um, so it's a it's a big complicated mess. But uh, basically, the narrative from the war party on TV is Russian aggression, Russian aggression, Russian aggression. And that this whole crisis started last March when the Russians took Crimea. Uh, invaded Crimea and uh, started backing these uh, aggressive separatists ever since then. And now the question is, what is America going to do about Russian aggression? And this is just no different, really, than saying, what is America going to do about all of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction? You know, you start with the false premise and then you ask the bogus question based on the false premise. And uh, But as Ray McGovern puts it, you know, why would you want to start the coverage of the crisis in the third inning here? Uh, what happened leading up to the seizure of Crimea was that the uh, Western powers, America in alliance with Germany leading the European Union, were trying to get a trade deal done with the president of Ukraine, who had agreed to do it but hadn't signed it yet. 
And then they let him know that it had to be all or nothing deal. You can't have a free trade deal with the EU and one with Russia at the same time. And then uh, Russia played their hand and they said, well, we'll give you $15 billion if you stay with us and, and turn the EU down. And at the same time, the president in charge is from the east. And the east is where the heavy industrial uh, base of Ukraine is. And they would all be completely bankrupted and put out of business by a new trade agreement with the EU that can make everything that they can do and much cheaper, right? It would be the end of their protectionism, and they stand a lot to lose in the short term uh, from losing their industry. And um, so the president, he was from the East and representing those interests more, and so then told the EU no. Then he had a bunch of protesters out there that came out. This was in November of 2013. Then you had all the protesters come out on the Maiden, and, and these are people, many of whom, they're sympathetic people. And if you and I lived in Kiev, we might well prefer a trade agreement with the Europeans um, to a trade deal and a closer relationship with the right. Russians. Uh, I don't really doubt that. But the problem is, it's sort of like being a dissident against Assad in Syria. If you're fighting Assad in Syria, it's not your fault necessarily, but you are the sock puppet of the Israelis, the Turks, the Saudis, and the Americans. And if you're fighting for Assad, then you're a sock puppet of Iran and Hezbollah and Russia. Because, sorry, but Syria is a crappy little country where they don't get to have a say in their future. That's decided by outside greater powers. That's just how it is. And I'm not saying that's okay, but I'm just saying that's the situation that they're in. So the, the protesters on the Maiden amounted to nothing but useful idiots for the American empire to take advantage of the protests and do a coup d'etat that then they could pretend was a popular revolution. Uh, they did more or less the same stunt back in 2004, uh, which helped led, lead to the current crisis. But anyway, uh, even in the New York Times version, Jeffrey, and it is an admission, it's not them accusing and, and you know taking my side, it's basically an admission, the way I read it by the New York Times, that after the president, the elected president, Poroshenko, made a deal with the EU, that he would hold new elections in December of 2014 and that he would withdraw his police from, uh, you know, where there had been clashes going on back and forth in the Maiden Square, uh, that they would pull their forces back and things would get back to normal again. And instead what happened was the leaders of the right sector Nazis and their friends in the Svoboda party, which Svoboda means freedom, but that's only good because they changed the name from the national, no, sorry, the Social Nationalist Party. Uh, and these guys proudly display their SS lightning bolts of the Gestapo, uh, proudly display, uh, display their swastikas and their uh, Wolf's Angle, uh, Wolf's Hook, which is their own version of the swastika. You, you might have seen it looks like a big capital N with a line through the middle of it. And uh, these groups are the descendants of those who serve the Nazis, the proud descendants. I'm not blaming people for who their father is. They're the proud descendants of the Banderists who fought for Hitler and murdered Poles and Jews in the Holocaust in World War II. And these guys are proud of that heritage, is who they are. And they're the ones who seized the buildings on the night of the 21st of February, 2014, and drove the government out of power. And then, boy, there's a lot here, and I know we're short on time. But there are a series of escalations on both sides. But when the Russians took Crimea, it was, I'm not saying okay or whatever. I don't carry any brief for the Russians whatsoever. Uh, but it was basically in response to the popular will of the people of Crimea, who never really were, Crimea never really was part of Ukraine. It, it had belonged to the Russian Empire since the days of our Articles of Confederation in the 1780s. And it had only been given to Ukraine by Khrushchev in the 50s when it didn't matter because it was all the USSR anyway. And it was a matter of just changing which department administered it. And then ever since the end of the Cold War, they had kept their naval base there at Sevastopol all along. And what Putin said was, you know, this is an obvious attempt. And I guess I left this out, but people know the history, I think, of all the NATO expansion and all the promises to eventually bring Ukraine into NATO. And Putin said, we thought about it and we decided. Do we want to visit our NATO friends at their new naval base down at Sevastopol? As much as we like them, we thought, nah, we'd keep our naval base and not give it up to you. 
And so, in other words, check and checkmate. And for an invasion, nobody was killed. Nobody was killed. Uh, the the uh, Navy and, and, I guess, Army and Marines and whatever special forces that were already based at Sevastopol just left their bases and took the whole peninsula. But the only shot fired was a warning shot over the heads of Ukrainian military. And then they had a plebiscite that uh, where they voted to go back to Russia. And so I'm not saying every bit of that is on the up and up, but it surely is not the start of the story. It was a reaction to American intervention and, and putting in a group of people in power who had made it clear uh, in numerous ways that they wanted into NATO and that they wanted to completely eliminate Russian influence in the country, which, uh, you know, for example, they outlawed Russian as a second language was the first thing that they did. And they kind of tried to take it back, but it was sort of too late. Um, and then uh, they also basically just, uh, there were uh, right sector Nazi attacks in Odessa and Mariupol where civilians were slaughtered. You might remember it was at the big labor building in Odessa in May where 40 something people were burned to death. Ramondo at antiwar.com called it Ukraine's Waco massacre. And that helped lead to the people of the East pulling the same stunt as the, those in Kiev and seizing the government buildings and declaring independence. Except Russia didn't back them. For all this about Russian aggression, Russia has not incorporated, they incorporated Crimea back, but they have not incorporated the East. And they have, have not made it clear, they have made it clear that they don't want to. I'm not saying you can trust that, but they certainly could have marched all the way to Kiev. If they wanted to, the Ukrainians couldn't stop the Russians from marching to Kiev. And, and Vladimir Putin joked about doing just that back in 2008 when George Bush and his buddy Shakashvili got us into, almost got us into a fight with them in Georgia. And Putin was saying about NATO expansion to Ukraine that, hey, I could get to Kiev in two weeks. You guys better look out. He hadn't done that. He hasn't seized the port town of Odessa, the port city, the massive port city of Odessa. Uh, what he's done is back the rebels. But then over the last year, there must have been 12 or 15 different times that the media and NATO claimed that the Russians had crossed the border with thousands of infantry, and yet they never proved it a single time. Over and over and over again, they would say, thousands of Russian troops are pouring over the border. And it wasn't true a single time. That's why they never proved it, because it never was true. And the one time, uh, and in fact, the OSCE, the Operation... Uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They were there and debunked all this stuff in real time over and over again for the last year. And so, but I'm sure there has been some help by the Russians in terms of coordination, probably weapons and special forces, but certainly much more um, on a lower key. And Kiev has lost the government, the American backed junta in the West, the coup d'etat regime backed by the Nazi right sector and the Azov battalion, another group of Adolf Hitler lovers out there fighting, they've lost. And so now Putin and Merkel brought them to the table and they've got a ceasefire. And so far the right sector Nazis are not abiding by it. And their leader, Andre Perubi, who is one of the members of the parliament and the new government is saying, I don't have to respect that ceasefire whatsoever. And if the government in Kiev doesn't like it, well, maybe I'll just depose them and do another coup. They couldn't stop me last time. How are they going to stop me this time? What are the police going to do? Nothing. And that's a guy who's a leader of a group of Nazis who's sitting in the Kiev parliament. And sorry, I left off the leaked phone call of the American ambassador to, uh, to Ukraine and the American representative to the EU plotting the entire coup that was leaked and put on YouTube three weeks before the coup happened, exactly like they plotted it, that we already heard them talking about how it was going to be. And anybody can watch that on YouTube. Uh, Newland and uh, Pyatt. This is the famous F the EU. And she was saying F the EU because they're not doing the coup good enough. She wants to nail this thing down right now. Well, I wish I, I knew more about the details of this case, but I do know that I have, there are many people that I have great sympathies for on both sides who seem to have very passionate op uh, opinions that seem to be radically different. And in fact, I think uh, uh, most European libertarians uh, don't seem to hold your view on the matter. And I, I don't know. I mean, do you, do you believe that it's possible to have differences on 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 this issue um, that are not um, malicious? 
I'm sorry, you cut out. I lost after believe. Do you believe it's possible to have differences on this on this position that are not uh, uh, essentially revealing of of American imperialist sensibility or, or malice or uh, harboring Nazi sympathies or something like that? Well, well, you know, like I say, the people on the Maiden who did all the protesting, they weren't all a bunch of Nazis, but they ended up being amounting to just useful idiots. They weren't the ones who got the power. The ones who got the power were the Americans and a bunch of bad guys. And so, you know, was it is it okay to detest Poroshenko and to even want to seem driven from power? Sure. Uh, but does that mean that you're not a sock puppet of the United States and Robert Kagan's wife and her machinations to try to screw the Russians? Sorry, but, uh, you know, this, is, this has been Ukraine's problem through history. You know, stuck between Russia and Germany and France and whoever the hell else is trying to get at the Russians. And it's just an unfortunate place to live when great powers are up to what they're up to. And this goes back to what I really should have said at the beginning, Jeffrey, which is that America has been on a deliberate path of expanding NATO since the late 1990s. And it's mostly just a project, a, a welfare project for Lockheed stockholders. Uh, to sell Lockheed products to Eastern European countries. And, you know, like Pat Buchanan says, in the days of Ike Eisenhower and Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, they drew a line at the Elbe River, halfway across Germany, right? And they said, you don't cross this line and we won't have a problem. Hungary, Czechoslovakia, sorry, but America can't save you from Russia. It's just a fact of geography, if you want to call it that. And now we've moved the line all the way to Russia's border. From the Elbe River, we've moved it to the east side of Poland. We've moved it to the Baltics. And they have openly proclaimed that they want to incorporate Ukraine into NATO. Now, just think for one instant what America's reaction would be if the Russians were messing around like this in Canada. If, if you know, 1% of my facts are straight, and this is the story that was going on, but with the shoe on the other foot. Um, you know, Crimea, Eric Margulies points out that the Russians lost hundreds of thousands fighting the Nazis uh, for Crimea. So I'm a Texan, and I know how, how strongly uh, Texans feel about the Alamo, which was a few dozen guys back in 1836, Okay. Uh, the Russians lost nearly a million men fighting for the Crimean Peninsula just seven decades Wait a minute. ago. Wait God, Six am I understanding ago. you correctly uh, that you okay. you think that, that Texas should belong to the United States and, and that uh, the Alamo should be owned by the Texas state government instead of its proper owners, the Catholic Church, is controlled by the Mex Mexican government? Well, you know what? I would be happy to sit on that jury in civil court and hash it out. That's for sure, man. I get so offended every time I go to the Alamo. No this used to be a church, and it became, you know, like an imperial outpost. <laughs> but listen. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, no, I mean, listen, um, my wife is Ukrainian, okay. and uh, she's from Odessa, and she doesn't even speak Ukrainian. She speaks sure. Russian, and that's partly – she has relatives who speak Ukrainian. Uh, but that is in, in great measure because of the communist policy of trying to eradicate Ukrainian culture and society uh, during the days of the Soviet yeah. Union. Uh, so, you know, there's just no question if people know the history of the 1930s in Ukraine at the hand of the Stalinists. Uh, if they know the history of World War II, you can't pick sides between the communists and the Nazis in, in Ukraine in World War II. It was nothing basically but a contest of who could kill the most innocent people. It's an absolute nightmare of two totalitarianisms yeah. at war. Um, and so there are absolute, the hardest of hard feelings here. You think about how much liberals and conservatives hate each other here. Think about real Nazis and real communists and how much they hate right. each other. Uh, people from the east and the west of Ukraine who've signed up these different sides. So I have absolute sympathy with any Ukrainians who resent Russian influence in their country. I'm just saying, not my problem, pal. And... Uh, you know, the guy in the in the Twitter fight you're referring to there, if you read his article, he's calling for America to arm up the Ukrainian government and to intervene yeah, in and this I, contest I think that's, in order that's to guarantee true, but I don't, Ukrainian independence I don't from think Russia. That's universally My answer true. to that is that's tough. Why. I don't think it's universally true. 
Yeah, of course. You know, Ahmed Chalabi wanted us to get rid of Saddam Hussein for him. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Al Qaeda, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, wanted us to get rid of Gaddafi for him. And the Nazis want us to keep the Russians terror. out of Ukraine. And the Nazis and their useful idiots. So, you know, I'm always against that kind of intervention, no matter what or where we're talking yeah. about. That's and a meanwhile, good, I'm a, accused of being on the payroll of the FSB, or else why would I dare tell the truth about any of this? <laughs> Okay, so I think I've decided that Spreecast is totally evil. Um, I hate this technology. Um, uh, I, I like Adobe Connect much better. It does seem a bit skippy. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. And, and it's frustrating me because I'm missing like every fourth word you're saying or something. It's really pissing me off. So. Um, oh, I'm sorry, man. I was interrupting Oh, it's you? not you're interrupting me. No, the, 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 our first world problems, right? I mean, you know, this is like a freaking miracle, those things. Taking place sure, at all, sure. but you know, I think I think I think we can. Well, I'm being quiet now, so go no, ahead. I couldn't. I'm sorry, not, I couldn't hear you if I was not, talking over you. I'm wanting to hear you better. That's it's that's that's the problem is the technology, not not your interrupting, not oh. your manners. Your manners are fine, Scott. <laughs> Listen, we're gonna call it tonight because. Okay. Yeah, your screen. What? Keeps freezing up. No, on it's me, terrible, too. and we've got this weird. We got a weird. We got a weird delay, and it's, and it's annoying as hell. And I and I think you know it's it's just too advanced to the tech and the digital age to put up with this any anymore. Next time, I think we're going to move to Adobe Connect, and it's going to be sure. better. Well, we'll work it out. So, um, it is past our time, so I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. And next time, we'll have to get to the other subjects we wanted to talk about, which is Fifty Shades of Grey. Right. Yes. <laughs> That's really important. And and the end of modern education and its future yeah, replacement. Yeah, its future replacement with, with, with something else, which whatever that is, is, is an improvement. Scott, my friend, thank you for spending time with me tonight. And uh, let's do it again very soon. I think we wanted once a month. I'm happy to do it more than that. If people want to do that, I'm all for it. Yeah, I, hey, whenever you're ready, I'm hey, ready. Hey, wait, I, I, have, I have a cool thing to display for you. Can I show you something really neat? Uh, I didn't hear the first I have, part of that. I have that, something yes. to, to to demonstrate for you. Okay, you ready for this? I have a live studio audience. So if, can everybody like clap and cheer? <laughs> so Scott, can you beat that? Can you, All right, I'm glad everybody. Yeah, liked. can you beat that? You can't beat that. <laughs> Oh, absolutely not. Okay, my friend. And thank you, everybody, for being so patient. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night, y'all.